Okay, this is a case presentation for the Interprofessional Student Showcase event. We are group one from the IPE FIT program, and we will be reviewing pediatric asthma, a case of inadequate access. So our patient, AB, has been suffering from asthma for the last two years and recently has shown with increased shortness of breath over the last four months due to both environmental and genetic factors. AB has several layers of barriers to her treatment for this condition. At the individual level, she is a 10-year-old female and in the fifth grade, therefore relying on her family for all healthcare and lifestyle decisions. AB's parents are both smokers who have holistic healthcare ideals. They live in a multifamily home and may have unknown triggers in both the house and their water quality. The family does not have access to a personal car, nor is there public transportation locally, so they do rely on other families that they share their building with for both childcare and transportation needs. There is limited access to specialist care in their area, however, they are within 20 minutes of the nearest hospital. AB's parents have low level of English literacy due to English as a second language and may have difficulty understanding the instructions from healthcare providers. Based on this information, we can suggest various ways um, and levels to help improve AB's condition and prevent disease progression. So the possible interventions that we've identified are um, adjusting the treatment protocol to include a daily inhaled corticosteroids as well as um, suggesting some alternative um, allergy treatments to the holistic methods that they are currently using. This includes uh, daily showers, maintaining a clean home, and over-the-counter allergy medications. Um, in the case of daily showers, we do have, uh, we've added the water assistance in Maine and um, in case they need help with uh, the water bill. We're also uh, hoping to educate the family on the importance of AB staying up to date on seasonal vaccinations. For the family, we want to educate them on their diagnosis. Uh, Maine has a great self-management education program. We added that as well uh, in home tobacco use education's role on the exacerbation of asthma, which you can also find on that education program. There's also some education on mold and lead contaminants and they can reach out to their landlord um, and they can also have their community health workers reach out to the landlord, which is the next step that we're talking about. Um, the community health workers are able to aid in language translation, healthcare, system notification, community resource connections, and legal matters. Um, the Multicultural Community and Family Support Services in Lewiston, Maine is a community um, health worker program. They have um, both uh, health and legal counsel in Spanish, French, and Somali, which is great because AB is a Somali immigrant, so the parents will be able to get the translation that they need. Um, we also want to make sure that they have uh, good access to healthy food, so looking into the Turner Food Bank and nutrition classes, as well as policy advocacy for in-school seasonal vaccinations for all of the kids um, to make sure that AB doesn't have any um, over access to um, getting sick. And for social determinants of health, we want to main, utilize main care transportation services for easier access to doctor's appointments and prioritize the use of a medical translator at all visits. And that goes right back to our community health workers because they're able to ensure that those are there. Thank you so much. Doing this, we found a lot of programs that Maine has for education and for um, adequate use and access to things. And I think that's going to be something that I look forward to looking into whenever I have patients who I'm not sure how they're dealing with things. It'll give me a lot more information to help deal with patients and um, patients' families as well. Yeah, I think I really just need to echo that. I was really impressed by the number of resources that exist in this area. Um, I'm not originally from New England, so I wasn't sure kind of what systems would be in place to work with. And I think that no matter where we end up practicing as future physicians, it will be really important to look into local resources um, because I know that they exist you know, nationwide, but it is so dependent on where you are located. Um, what about, because um, you guys were talking about advocating for school, um, you know, for vaccine program. How do you go about to do that? Any ideas? 
I think, again, you know, the resources that we looked into in terms of this type of a project would vary pretty broadly depending on where you're located. So, um, you know, in Maine, it's really county based. In certain states, it might be school district based. Um, and kind of depending on the school that your patient attends, if it's private or public, of course, would make a difference. Um, but typically going through the school board is kind of a good place to start. And that can be kind of structured differently depending on where your school is located and kind of their oversight. Um, but contacting the school board and they typically have like a health profession or somebody in that position who helps make decisions as far as medical direction at their nursing facilities and things like that. So I think kind of going at it from that angle would ensure that it's not only targeting one institution, um, but hopefully, you know, district or county wide. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, you're not just helping one kid, you're helping a group. Exactly. I, I had the opportunity to hear the group at the beginning of the semester. So I just appreciated the way you've been able to come forward with it. And um, I, I appreciate the interventions that you came up with. Thank yeah. you for your work on it. It's it's good. I echo what Jen Morton had said earlier. You know, it, it's really nice to see see your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, really spent a lot of time trying to figure out the local resources. Uh, there are a lot of new things I never heard of, and then they find out. Any other questions? Before and they can on. change over time. Ling and I right. were talking about that earlier. You know, it, it is important to check again because sometimes like during COVID, some things went offline that might have been a resource and mm -hmm. other ones came up in their place. So they do change over time. It's it's good to always keep a, a fresh list of the resources. Right. Right. I think there was a, something in the news just yesterday was talking about a uh, translator in a health uh, setting and uh, uh, many people are not really liking this sort of a, a video translator. They actually love to have an in-person translator. Um, All right, this is a JB patient-centered framework for chronic pain. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Dinsdale. I'm a second year student at Calm. I'm a part of lovely team five with this uh, great case about JB. Hi everyone, I'm Pavania and I'm also part of team five and I'm an OMS one student as well. Hi, I'm Hi everybody, I'm, I'm Richard. Uh, sorry, I'm, I've got some noise in the background, but uh, I am a year a P1 pharmacy student uh, at UNE, and uh, I am part of Team 5. And I'm Maddie. I'm also a scholar in a public area, but um, I'm a D1 at the UNE College of Dental Medicine. This is the case yes. of JB, a patient experiencing chronic pain. We have developed a patient-centered framework to demonstrate the intersection of factors contributing to this condition and brainstorm possible interventions to improve JB's health. JB is a 52-year-old lobsterman living on a remote island in Hancock County, Maine. Throughout his career, he has suffered serious injuries which have left him in chronic pain. This is a list of JB's current medical conditions. He has been prescribed medication to manage his type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and depression, though he admits to taking them inconsistently. JB is a lifelong smoker and had been a social drinker before his recent divorce. His partner was an essential part of his routine and helped him to manage his extensive health care needs. The divorce has added additional stress and he notes that his fellow lobstermen have expressed concern regarding his increased alcohol consumption. JB's income is highly dependent on production and the time of year. As a result, he consumes mostly processed foods during the off-season. Due to his income, he does not qualify for government assistance but does not have access to insurance through work. This patient-centered framework, which was developed for the FIT IPE program, demonstrates the intersection of biological, environmental, and socioeconomic factors that interact to make up JB's unique healthcare needs. Given the multifaceted nature of his health, there are several opportunities to provide optimal, individualized care for JB and his lobstering community. JB has limited health literacy as he did not pursue a post-secondary education. However, it's important for patients such as JB to learn how to advocate for themselves within the existing healthcare system. Consequently, it's equally as important for healthcare providers to recognize patterns of need and the patients with whom they interact daily. Advocacy for the integration of training regarding bias and stigma-free language 
in addition to broader discussions on health equity, can help patients like JB to seek care earlier. The healthcare system has a plethora of programs to help patients address their needs. However, many programs are unknown to patients without extensive knowledge of the system. Main care partners can provide health education about medical conditions and how to manage them. Free care and or payment plans can help patients think about the financial obligations of care. A social worker may help to provide additional support and bridge the gap between patients and the healthcare system. And counselors and nutritionists may be able to help manage the symptoms of JB's depression and poor diet. These are potential organizations that can provide support and accountability for JB as he navigates his alcohol use disorder. Finally, additional resources may be required in order for patients to successfully manage their healthcare concerns. However, it's often difficult to know where to begin. Programs like the Maine Health Patient Assistance Line exist to aid individuals in navigating the healthcare and insurance systems. Programs like Maine Care can provide transportation to medical appointments and social care networks like Find Help can help individuals search for resources like healthcare, food, and shelter at free or reduced costs. We're open up for questions. Dr. Hall, do you want to start us out? Uh, I'm just interested in knowing uh, what uh, JB's primary goal for care was when he uh, joined his team. So uh, thank you for your question. Um, as a group, there is obviously this case was very complex. We think the first step is trying to help him manage his conditions because he has several comorbidities especially the chronic pain aspect um, but the bigger part that we think his overall goal is is managing access to care which is very difficult in the state of Maine so we were hoping to at least provide him with a list of resources and help connect him to better physicians um, granted his comorbidities unfortunately cause him to see various doctors that don't often communicate which is where we could um, see substance um, use disorder and other other issues come into play. So we were thinking the first goal would be try to set him up with one specific physician, um, try to find better time granted around his very busy schedule as a lobsterman, and then from there be able to actually manage the conditions itself. So Samantha, I, I uh, lodge you uh, as a group in being so multidisciplinary about your, your goals, but what was his goal? So to add to what Sam said, his primary goal was to manage his chronic pain. Um, but in addition to that, he did come in with a little bit of concern about his increased drinking because his community had mentioned that he had been drinking a little bit more than usual. So he wanted to have a more organized plan for his chronic pain, but also came in with this side concern about the alcoholism. If you guys could, um, let's see, use a little bit of technology, uh, let's see, uh, uh, insurance covered, uh, what would you suggest? Is there anything you can think of? So as a group, we originally started talking about telehealth, um, but we thought we're not so sure about how actually convenient that would be for this patient necessarily, while he does have the ability to have Wi-Fi. Granted, it's a bigger issue surrounding the times of day that he's working because not every physician or healthcare team is able to be as flexible as we would hope. Um, so we were trying to think of maybe like a phone call or something to that aspect where he could be in contact with a physician that he trusts and has built that rapport with. Um, because I feel like Wi-Fi might not be the most um, feasible aspect we could depend upon for this patient specifically. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys have heard about something, um, you know, like a medical prescribable apps. Um, so there, there are some available FDA approved for diabetes management. Um, I don't know one for chronic pain uh, that hopefully something available in the future. Uh, it doesn't require patient, you know, have a sort of a cell phone connection. Um, usually once the patient get prescription and they can work with the team from the, the clinics and then they will set up the app on the phone and uh, sort of a teach them how to use it. Um, it could uh, provide educational programs. It could uh, provide uh, uh, reminders. So like the diabetes will remind, you know, Know, checking your blood sugar, those kind of thing. Um, and then you can add your sort of a symptoms and your own report. So then the, the physician can get um, information. Uh, it, it could be like a real-time information and in going back and forth. Um, 
So hopefully something like that could be, be used in the future. Did your team include a behavioral health specialist? At finding one, yes, because in the state of Maine, um, I did my MPH through UNE. Um, so finding a behavioral health specialist in the state of Maine is very far and few in between. Um, unfortunately, just due to the demographics in the area, um, that is the goal is to integrate one. So within the list of resources, which at the end of our presentation had a QR code that if you scanned would bring you to the list of different resources or their corresponding sites, they had lists of different behavioral health specialists to help with managing his depression, a nutritionist for diet, um, different avenues to that effect. Um, again, all within a cost efficient um, form for the patient. I was interested in this from a perspective of behavioral health in relationship to managing the chronic pain. I recognize he has co-occurring diagnoses of substance use uh, disorder and uh, affective disturbance, but finding someone who can help him make good behavioral changes in managing his pain would be an appropriate adjunct. I really love that you guys have advocacy as a number one. Uh, that's really important considering one third of individuals suffering from chronic pain uh, in Maine. Um, but yes, my name is Gabriel Peckframe. I'm a second year medical student and uh, happy to share this case with y'all. Hi everyone, I'm Darina Shannon and I'm a first year graduate student at the Applied Nutrition Program at UNE. Good to be here. Hi, this is PHIT Team 4's patient centered framework of our patient, Mr. Ryan, and his total gastronectomy. I'm Julia Barasevich, a first year medical student. Hi, I'm Darina Shannon. I'm a first year graduate student with MSAN at UNE Online. And also on our team is Gabe Peck Frame, a second year medical student, and Katie Centinello, a fourth year medical student. So our patient, Mr. Ryan, is a 41-year-old half-Korean male retired U.S. Navy chief petty officer who recently underwent a total gastrinectomy for gastric cancer. His medical history also includes gastroesophageal reflux, nicotine dependence, overweight, major depressive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. He resides in Hampton Roads, Virginia with a supportive wife and three children. He has recently been discharged from the hospital and must learn to navigate his new cancer diagnosis, diet post-gastrinectomy, previously diagnosed comorbidity, and lifestyle changes associated with his recent retirement. Maintaining an appropriate diet will minimize the chances of post-operative complications that might prolong his recovery. We recommend that he eat small, frequent meals that are high in protein and low in added sugars to avoid dumping syndrome. Mr. Ryan should avoid spicy foods, caffeine, soda, and alcohol to help reduce acid reflux, which could cause more harm. We will provide Mr. Ryan with this resource and more for how to ease into this new diet and follow these guidelines. Family support will also play a crucial part in Mr. Ryan's recovery. So we suggest formally educating his family and friends on his new diagnosis and new dietary requirements. Despite having good family support, we recommend that he enlist the support of home health services through the VA using his TRICARE benefits so that his wife is able to return to work. Mr. Ryan's healthcare is well managed through his case manager, Alex, at the VA, who also helped enroll him in a clinical trial that utilizes art therapy for those with PTSD. Engaging in physical activity will be critical for his health, so we suggest he engage in the local chapter of the team Red, White, and Blue, which is a nationwide veterans health and wellness organization. Volunteering will also maintain a sense of purpose in his new retired role, so we encourage him to continue to volunteer at the Husky Rescue he was previously involved in. Fortunately, Mr. Ryan lives in a suburban setting with minimal issues of access. We recommend that he work with his team at the VA to identify local farmers markets, stores, or restaurants that are able to provide him options that will fit into his new dietary requirements. Also, they can help him find a safe place for walking near his home. And this concludes our presentation on Mr. Ryan's total gastrectomy. Our multidisciplinary team employed a patient-centered approach and developed a framework that encompasses all his health contributing factors, including individual, family, friends, community, and environment. The framework helped us develop appropriate interventions and provide a holistic approach to Mr. Ryan's treatment. Any questions? Mr. Ryan seems to have a difficult time of it. <laughs> all right, sorry, I was talking without uh, turning my mic on. Um, so I was just uh, saying that uh, the uh, nutritional recommendation was really comprehensive. Um, that really great. We have a dietitian in, in the team. Um, so if no one else asks a question, I want to ask this question name. 
you know, plan to ask every team, uh, how is this experience going to change your future practice? Uh, well, I, I think, um, Ellie and uh, her her team uh, answered it really well, and so I'm going to kind of echo what what they said in that I think uh, one of the largest lessons lessons for me from this experience and um, process uh, was to always be considering local resources available, and to also be always considering kind of all aspects of the patient's uh, life and well being that we can sometimes miss and overlook when we get caught up in the nitty gritty details. Um, for example, our team um, was late in the game in adding um, any kind of behavioral health, um, and it was only after the suggestion of, I think, uh, either another another classmate or Dr. Lee or Dr. Chow um, about that. And it was just, you know, I, after they said that, I was like, I can't believe we, we hadn't thought of that. But I think it's just a great example of all of the many different facets um, that go into care and the different types of care that that someone like Mr. Ryan might need. And you really need a team to care a patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Darina, you want to add something to this? I think that we got lucky with Mr. Ryan. He seems to have a really good support system. Um, considering his social determinants of health, uh, we didn't see too many issues. Um, he lives in a nice neighborhood. Um, he has transportation means, he has access uh, to safe, um, nutritious food. Um, his wife is a nurse. Um, his whole family is just really supportive. So we got lucky with that aspect for sure. Um, but just for the whole experience, it was really wonderful to work with all those talented medical students. It was such an honor for me to learn from them and collaborate with them. Um, and I think we really did a great job coming together and putting all of this, this work together. So I'm really, really happy for that. Right back at you, my friend. Honor to work with you too. Yeah, a lot of nutrition knowledge than the, what we can provide from the COM curriculum. Ask the students, how will it change your future practice? Like not only do you now know a tremendous amount about each other's scope of training, and responsibility, but there are, you know, many, many other healthcare fields out there that weren't on this case with you that you would wished had been. Um, how do you plan to operationalize getting to know them as well as you now get to know each other? <laughs> that that's a great question, um, and I think. Unfortunately, we're not going to be given such uh, good opportunities with such, you know time uh, to form these connections and, and work through these kinds of hard problems. Um, but I think overall, it's been a great uh, learning experience, um, kind of emphasizing that the fact that there are so many different kinds of uh, health professions and just professions in general that can potentially be of help, maybe not even directly in the healthcare field themselves, um, but that can still be of assistance. Uh, in a situation like this, like, for example, the Husky rescue that Dr. that Mr. Ryan was um, participating in uh, and programs like that. So I think uh, kind of coming back to treating the whole patient and all aspects of the patient and working with all the different fields um, that might contribute to that um, and looking for those for those people to to work in conjunction with. I feel Dorina, like uh, curiosity, <laughs> curiosity is going to be your friend, like moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Darina, can you tell us a little bit about your program? Because you're an online student, right? Yes. It's a wonderful program. I'm so happy I found it because it's an FEM model, future education model. So it allows for people from um, non-nutrition backgrounds to come into the field and uh, complete the two-year program and sit for the RD registered dietitian exam at the end of the two years. So we do academic work concurrently with um, our exposure to clinical, um, as well as food service management and community um, hours. It's called supervised experiential learning. So sort of similar to internship, but uh, just named differently. But it's a very accelerated program, fast paced. Um, and I'm really, really happy I found it. It's one of the very few in the nation, actually, that allows for such streamlined process. So I'm very, 
very happy that I'm a part of it. It's been great so far. That's great. It would be nice that, uh, you know, we can incorporate you guys into our comp curriculum as well, because uh, we try to teach some nutrition, but it's definitely not enough. Uh, just give students a little bit of flavor in, uh, you know, things they might encounter in the future. Um, just for all the future doctors out there, please do not use albumin as a sign of malnutrition. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, that's a good one. <laughs> All right, so this is the final talk for um, this uh, uh, patient framework track. Uh, this is a very interesting case as well, um, a case study on an HIV patient in May, all right, from a FIT Team 3. This presentation is part of the UNA Public Health Problem Solving and Interprofessional Teams Project for Fall 2023. My name is Julie, and I'm a student of dental hygiene and psychology. Nazifa and Brittany are both students of osteopathic medicine, and we're here to discuss Ms. Brown and HIV, along with barriers that unhoused individuals face when seeking medical treatment. Ms. Miranda Brown is a Caucasian female, age 26, who is presenting with symptoms related to HIV infection and substance use disorder. She has recently lost her health insurance coverage as a dependent, which has led to the cessation of her antiretroviral therapy treatment for HIV. She has been unhoused for several years and is also suffering from food insecurity, insomnia, and depression. As the unhoused crisis continues to grow in America, it is up to us as healthcare professionals to be aware of our state and local assistance programs so that we can share those resources with those individuals and families who do not have direct access to medical care. Hi everyone, my name is Nazifa and I'm a first year osteopathic medical student here at Unicom. So moving on to what brings Ms. Brown to us in clinic today, this slide just shows the information we were able to gather for her first visit. So she has that history of HIV and recent non-adherence to her medications, which has contributed to the symptoms that she's presenting with, such as intermittent fevers, cough, the rapid weight loss. She's also in a highly stressful environment because she is undomiciled and unable to have adequate sleep at night. Thankfully, she has a good support system with friends and family, but it's just difficult for her to maintain contact with them. So we really want to focus on the aspects in Miranda's life that were more modifiable. So that includes like her housing and insurance status, her diet. We recognize that although these are very significant barriers that take a lot of work, a lot of time and a lot of patience to overcome, her resilience and her commitment to positive change provides that really solid foundation for her to move forward with that holistic care plan that we'd like to initiate for her. So that includes her working with the case manager, receiving job training and seeking drug rehabilitation. And it's also a plus that she lives in a city like Portland, which is filled with so many different resources, so many different services to help those who really need them. She just needs some guidance to seek them out and then also navigate them. In order to ensure that Ms. Miranda Brown gets the care that she needs, we have come up with a series of potential interventions that we think could help her. The first step is to initiate a care plan through the Portland Free Clinic and have her be seen by a medical provider for treatment and immediate relief of the current symptoms that she's experiencing. We would then like to encourage her to visit the Franny Peabody Center. In here, they will set her up with a case manager who can assist her with paperwork, treatment plans. They can provide HIV medications and also connect her to counseling through the Ryan White program. This organization can also assist her with finding housing, employment, and they can help her enroll in main care. We would then like to consult her family for reconnection in order to provide Miranda Brown with more emotional support. Lastly, we would identify and help facilitate enrollment in drug prevention and rehabilitation programs. One facility is Crossroads, which assists women with drug treatment and is located nearby, so it could be an excellent resource for her. All in all, we hope that these interventions are tools that she can use in order to get her back on track in terms of taking her HIV medication, seeking counseling and help for her drug addiction, and also place her in a more stable environment and off the streets. All right. So um, can team members uh, identify yourself first and before we ask a questions? I'm Julie. I'm Brittany. I'm a second year medical student at COM. And Julie, I'm do you want to? I'm a first year. All right, Julie, oh. do you want to identify which program you're from? Oh, uh, dental hygiene uh, with a minor in psychology. I'll start out. Um, so, how is this experience to change your? Is going to change your future practice? 
at least I think, be. I think like one of um, the interesting things about this case is that it's very applicable to what could be seen in the real world, especially in a city like Portland. Um, and I think being able to get to know some of the resources that these patients can be connected to through social workers was really eye-opening. And I, you know, didn't know that uh, case managers like at the Franny Peabody Center could actually go out and visit these people in the public if they couldn't even get to the center. So um, it was really eye-opening to learn about the accessibility of some of these resources. Um, I guess I'll add to that. Um, I, I think to understanding that when patients usually come in to see somebody, it's because they have an immediate issue that they need to address that they can no longer ignore. And a lot of times there's a lot of comorbid factors that are included with that. So kind of having a bigger picture on how to address immediate issues and then work towards addressing additional issues that will help kind of correct or balance those in initial issues, I think is very important. And, and also, again, like Brittany was saying, it's just understanding what resources you have available locally. I mean, what we have here in Portland is different from what is up north in Bangor and, and so on and so forth. So understanding what's accessible to your patients and having empathy, you know, when they come in and, and not making judgment and just, you know, just trying to help them to your best of your ability by giving them resources and, and helping them seek those resources out if you can. Yeah, and I completely agree with, with these two. And I also was super um, impressed with how accessible some of these resources and services are, um, where like as a physician, you can recommend your patients to be doing things, but then also providing them the actual names of buildings and names of services that they can actually go to instead of just saying, okay, yeah, go monitor your blood pressure instead of actually <laughs> um, giving them that source. So I really, really appreciated seeing all the resources that we were able to provide there. So there's a I question did see in the chat about the <laughs> implicit bias. Yes, yeah, so the right. implicit bias. So I, I think absolutely. I think, you know, when, when you see somebody that's unhoused, you immediately think a lot of, you have a lot of assumptions about, you know, how they're not taking care of themselves or it, it, and it's, it's hard to realize that, you know, they may want to take care of themselves. They just may not know how to or have access to things. And I think not being judgmental and really just taking a step back and putting yourself in their shoes, how they might be feeling, even just coming to you and how how brave that is of them to, you know, overcome their own challenges to come and see you. I think uh, as long as you're non-judgmental and, and you kind of check yourself at the door, then I think that's a really good approach. Brittany and uh, Nazareth, do you want to add to this? I think that um, I was lucky enough that I had just, in my curriculum this past year, I had just come off of learning about HIV and treatment options. And we had a whole discussion with a physician in the field about biases and everything. So I don't think, I understand that there are biases that we are all going to constantly face, but I think in terms of crafting it, I didn't experience any biases. I think um, maybe the only thing is like, for me, like I'll be in the role as a physician. So I think that I have some barriers in terms of what I can do of providing the person in this case with housing and connecting to resources. So I'm just going to have to lean on other providers in the health field to help make those connections for my patients. Yeah, I think that's a completely fair point. This patient was actually inspired by um, a patient that I saw in urgent care during my great gap years who had the history of HIV. Um, and I think it's super important that when they're coming to you in that vulnerable state, for everybody on the care team, whether it's like the person at the receptionist, the triage nurse, and everyone so forth, is able to address everything with care and just with some sensitivity. And that that experience sort of like kind of um, helps me to, uh, in my future practice, to be able to have that sensitivity as well. So uh, from this experience, what surprised you the most? I think that from this experience, I was... Um, I had also done the the IPTI project, so the interprofessional um, teamwork that was very, you know, patient oriented with like a lot of different medical providers involved. And so I think I was surprised in this situation how just seeing how little um, involvement we kind of set up in terms of like healthcare based. Like we really focused on a lot of a lot of other social aspects that do relate to a person's health. But that was just interesting to see how many 
um, social aspects we wanted to cover and make sure that we connected her with interventions. Mm -hmm. So Julie, I really want to hear uh, your perspective too, because you're the only uh, dental hygienist the dental. Students we have. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, the slight gingivitis isn't exactly her biggest uh, concern right now. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, dental offices that do not accept main care. Um, but main care does offer dental services for people who are in need. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Um, you know, I think people think of... Um, uh, it, it's hard. Like I would love for, for dental care to be part of healthcare and be included in health insurance, but um, there are clinics. In fact, UNE, uh, the dental hygiene clinic is a clinic where people can come and we do accept main care and we do um, scaling cleaning. We, we assess, you know, physical health, oral health. We take vitals, you know, we have really great advice for patients. Um, so knowing that those resources are there, you know, kind of spreading the word um, that we, you know, we can absolutely help you out and we can send you referrals to places that will accept your insurance um, if you are covered like under the Affordable Care Act. So really great. Excellent. I love to Coming give to dental hygiene. Final. I love to give dental hygiene the last word. We're so glad to have you uh, participate in our IPE activities. Thank you, Ling so much for being a uh, uh, flexible and patient um, faculty facilitator for our session today. I apologize again for the uh, technical difficulties, but, um, and I thank everyone for their participation. I hope you will complete the attendance form before you leave. Let us know how we did. And I hope that you will continue to be lifelong friends and team members. Thank you, Chris. Um, you made the session smooth, um, you know, whichever uh, difficulties we had. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and uh, hopefully we enjoyed the session and uh, everything um, is recorded. Right, Chris? So uh, you can uh, visit other tracks and uh, look at all those uh, presentations as well. Great. Thank you.